Okay, so far we've seen what is the meaning of principal component analysis and some basic analysis related to how to visualize the eigenvalues, how to visualize the impact of some variables in, in the principal components, and how can we reshuffle or how can we reclassify all the points according to the new axis. Okay, in this video I'm going to talk about five topics which are related to PCA. Some of them are not very well known and I think they are worth knowing. So if you remember in the first video, in the introduction one, we talk about this idea of eigenfaces and how could we reconstruct the data using only a few components. The idea was that instead of storing the whole image, we could store just the eigenfaces for, for all the, let's say, photographs in the database, and only the scores are relevant to reconstruct the face. Okay, let's see how this works. So I'm going to take this data set, the traffic data set, and I'm going to plot just one of the hours, so this is 6 p.m., as you can see that this is the way you can look at the series. So you have 360 observations, one per day of the year, and we see the traffic pattern at different days. You can see a strong seasonality, and this is related to the fact that on weekends traffic is much lower than in work weeks. Now I'm going to do the following. I'm going to take, for each individual, I'm going to take the coordinates. This coordinates for individuals is what we call the scores, and I'm going to do a matrix multiplication for the first two components of of the analysis, okay? In order to, to have this multiplication right, you have to do the analysis with only two components, but you can you can plug here one, column two, if you want to do for more general case. Okay, so I'm basically I'm here, I'm multiplying each score for the, each component. So this is basically the same operation as I was doing here. Okay, so this is the outcome, and you can see that the series is not completely equal. One of the reasons why we don't see it, it likely is because this is not standardized information, and this is the original one. But you can see that we have captured the most part of the information. So we have this go trending going up in, into the summer and then trending going back. We have also captured the, the seasonality and probably some of the spikes that we see in the data. Okay, let's compare both series. This is the reconstructed, only two principal components, and this is the original one. And you can see that this is a very good linear regression between them, okay? The, the R squared actually is 0.92, which is pretty high. And that means that basically the, this time series, there is some deviation around the, around the original one, but we have captured pretty well the, the, the behavior. Another thing that we can do with principal components is reconstruct the mean plus the variance. So let me show you this with the same example. So here we have 366 observations, so this is a kind of time series, one for each day of the day. Of the day. And now you can see that if you take a look at the principal components, almost all the variance is in the first two principal components. That means that we could drop all the, vari all the dimensions there. Okay, so now let's take these principal components and I'm going to do the following. I'm going to take and I'm going to plot the, the mean value of the data, so I'm going to average all of these observations, and then I'm going to show you what, what is, how, how does the, the mean plus minus that the principal components looks like. So this is the mean value. You can see that we are capturing pretty well this idea that we have a peak around, let's say, 6 or 7 p.m. and we have low traffic at early in the morning and late at night, okay? Now, this is the same. I, I'm, I'm subtracting and adding the first principal component to the mean. You can see here this is the mean. And I'm multiplying this by 50, not because 50 is an important number, but because in order to have some, some difference between the, the scale principal component and the original value. This is because the average value of this is around, let's say, 500. So the square root of 500 twice is more or less 50. Okay, this is the idea, but this number is completely relevant. But I want to show you here is that when you take a look at the mean and the red and the blue line, and the, the red line is plus the principal component one and the blue is minus the principal component one, you can see what is the meaning, what is the interpretation of the principal component. Basically, the principal component or the series could be described as follow. Every day is the mean and at some hours, which basically are early in the morning and peak hours, let's say, or even late at night, a principal component is to explain deviations around now, the variance around those hours. What about the second principal component? Now you can see that it's, it has a ring around the points in which principal component 1 was large, and you can see that principal component 2 is specialized in this part of, of the hours of the day, between, let's say, 9 a.m. to uh, 3 p.m. or so. So what's the interpretation of the second principal component? Interpretation is the following. Every point could be described as the average value and the second principal component is correcting a little bit in the same way as the eigenfaces are correcting each phase, correcting but only at these hours. If you put both, inf both informations together, you can see that you're capturing with the first principal components almost all the variance in the data because you have the mean value and then you can see that both principal components are complementary. 
so you can have a good envelope of what we expect to be the variability of the data around the day. And you can see that this interpretation matches pretty well with this uh, correlation diagram that I'm plotting here. So here you can see that the first principal component is specialized in, in this range of hours here and there, and the second principal component is in the middle hours in the day. The next topic that I want to review is the so-called quality of the representation. So quality of representation essentially is giving us information about what's the projection of a variable or individual in a given principal component. And it's defined as the cosine of the angle of the vector produced by this variable in this correlation diagram that we saw the other day yeah, along the, the principal component. Okay, this is the same as the cosine similarity that we have covered in another video. So this has given us an idea of how low is this angle in this representation. So take a look at the data. If you take the, the outcome of the PCA function of the factor mine R and you look inside the variable, you can see this cosine too. You can see that it's a positive value and this is because this is the cosine square. And you can see that for some variables, it is, this parameter is small, like, like for instance, population with respect to dimension one, but it is pretty large for other parameters. Let's say infant mortality per thousand births is pretty large. That means that this variable is well represented in the principal component. So this is another way to look at the influence of some variables in, in, in diagrams. So these are correlations and basically the cosine square is, is trying to relay the, the projection around that. So a large cosine means a couple of things. It means the distance to the circle, but also the, the low angle there. So it's, it's kind of containing the same information as in this diagram, but it's giving us a more accurate representation. So the larger the cosine square, the more horizontal in the case of the first dimension and the more vertical in the case of the second dimension. And this is why sometimes you can redo some of the plots using this as a color scale. So the larger the cosine square, let's say more orange are, are going to be the diagram. So now you have a good idea of, of which variables are most representative. So here you can see that the darker in, in this diagram is infant mortality per thousand births. And that doesn't mean that these other variables are not correlated. It, it means that it's more well represented in that direction. Here is the same. So if you take a look at the second dimension, other is the, the one which the let's say darker orange uh, color. So other is, is the variable which is best represented by the second dimension. Another interesting topic is the, the use of supplementary elements. And the idea was to split the data set instead of using all the quantitative variables, leave some observations, some individuals outside, and also leave some quantitative and qualitative variables outside. Why is this interesting? Because sometimes we can use qualitative variables to plot the data to have a better idea of what's going on with each principal component. And the use of supplementary variables has two, two uses. One use could be simply using a kind of cross-validation, so repeat the analysis over and over again and see what happens when we change the number of variables in the first stage. And the second idea is that sometimes some of the variables are not exactly related to the others. So imagine that we have some economical variable, like let's say GDP per capita, and some variable which is life expectancy. So of course, maybe they are related, but maybe sometimes we want to do a PCA of all the macroeconomical variables and then use this variable just to see in retrospective the, the relation between those supplementary variables and the principal components. So with factor mine R, we have the, this function PCA, and there are a lot of parameters that you can use. And actually, the only thing that you have to provide, for instance, to include auxiliary observations, is to include the number of indexes. So here you have you are just plugging a vector with integer numbers. The same for quantitative supplementary variables and for qualitative supplementary variables. So it's, it's really easy to use. And the good thing is that you don't have to split in advance the data frame. So it's very handy. So let's see an example. Let's take this uh, data set. Remember, we are comparing countries. And now we can say that we're going to sample randomly 25 observations. So these are going to be the supplementary individuals. And then we can sample also the, the, the columns. So we can sample between this subset only only choosing five of those variables. And now you can see that my uh, auxiliary individuals are the, the elements of this vector i, and my quantitative supplementary variables, the elements of j. And of course, the qualitative supplementary variables are also included in this data frame. Okay, when you do that and you plot, for instance, the correlation cycle, you see something really interesting. Remember that phones per thousand people was one of the most important variables. Now, in this case, because of this randomization, we haven't used that. And that has changed the sign of the, the first dimension. So remember that infant mortality was on the other side of the axis, the same as birth rate. Um, but GDP per capita and phones per thousand people and literacy were actually clustered the same. What's the meaning of this? This means that phones per thousand people is a still an important variable, despite the fact that we have been used that variable. And this is a great result, but because 
that means that phones and GDP per capita and literacy are so strongly correlated that even if we remove phones per thousand people in, in the data frame, we still have valuable information about what's the meaning of the first dimension. We can also use uh, supplementary individuals to see if we have some outliers in the data. In this case, you can see that 137 wasn't included in the analysis, and now it looks like an outlier for the rest of them. So these countries, in, in this case, are worth studying. And we are going to leave the other two topics for another video.